morning, all, and thank you for joining us on this day after Memorial Day. We have a team of presenters here to share insights with you as you're preparing to either restart your business or preparing to en enrich or, or improve the operation of your business in these unprecedented times. So we'll be going over a number of aspects of business that will help you in preparing this. So I think it's important to start with kind of accentuating the positive. These are, these are clearly unprecedented times, and we, we in our lifetimes haven't gone through something, something quite like this. We, we've had some situations in the past, but nothing like this. And so it's really important to accentuate the positive and be able to determine a, a healthy um, and vibrant path forward for you and your businesses. So we're gonna encourage you today to examine your business conditions. We're gonna, we're gonna touch on a number of things on how to do that. We're also going to en encourage you to, to really plan because the more realistic plan you can put in place today, the more successful your restart will be. As a team, we've taken a systematic approach to touching all the aspects of business to make sure that, that you're really addressing your holistic business as you plan to restart. And, and we want to emphasize that although it's positive and in ways in which you can restart, you will need to make some difficult decisions to move forward. And we know those are, are difficult to do and our SCORE mentors are here to work with you through those. So the team today and the team of 80 mentors we have serving the Lancaster community are here to help you pivot your process and restart successfully. Um, I neglected to mention at the beginning, and I apologize, so I'll insert it right here. I do have you all muted. Um, please input questions on the chat feature, and we'll address those questions as we um, get to the end of the presentation. We'll go through everything and then, and then take questions and answers at the end. So in terms of thinking of this process that we're gonna share with you today, uh, we think of it as a three-legged stool, something we've all heard about many times um, over our lives, this concept of a three-legged stool. And, and things are more stable when all three co components or all three legs are balanced together. So we're really encouraging you to consider integrated planning. We're going to talk about the application of state and national regulations and how they impact what you're doing. And then we're going to talk about multifunctional approach for restarting your business. So because of COVID-19 and the new regulations that have come down at the national and state levels, safety and efficacy really impact every aspect of your business. They will influence the way you market and the way you engage customers. They will influence the way you operate your, bill, your um, business and facility, and they'll certainly have an impact on your financials for your business. So it's really important to interact these functions um, to build the right business plan as you move forward. So what we've done is thought of it in terms of a process. And, and you, you, we encourage you to think about all these aspects. You may assess your business and want to focus on channel and sales and employee practices. But in any case, we're gonna to touch on all of these pieces today to provide you with the thought where you will need when you're planning your business and you're working with mentors to put your processes in place to either reopen safely or to, to improve your business that may be open to posture it for successful growth moving forward. It's important to look at where you were at the time um, prior to COVID-19 um, impacting our lives. And so look at your, what your financials were for your business. Understand where you made money, understand where your expenses are, but use that as a baseline because the changes that you need to put in place to your business will augment those financials and get you to a revised set of financial analysis of your business going forward. And one, one thing we as SCORE mentors have been emphasizing with all of our clients is no time like the present is cash king. So it's really important to think about how you're doing things and manage your cash flow so that you have the cash you need to make the improvements or changes that you need to make 
to be viable as you go forward. There are a number of market trends that are important to think about and, and incorporate into your planning. Not only are there the regulatory impacts that, that are impacting how business operates, um, but key market trends. People are becoming much more accustomed to internet, whether it's online um, shopping, online ordering, online search for information. Um, the, the internet has a huge impact on the way consumers interact with your business and the way businesses need to operate to, um, to be effective. Um, it will also cause you to change, um, change your business because co consumer trends change. So segments of consumers are going to be extremely cautious about the impact of COVID-19 on their personal well-being and their, their well-being and how it impacts others. So how you protect customers, how you inform them will be really key to how you operate the business. So being cognizant of these market trends will influence your operations, both from a marketing and an operation standpoint as you go forward. And then stay true to your company purpose. Review that. You may need to augment it slightly. Um, there are companies, there was an article in the paper about a company that um, Dutch works that was making hammocks and is now making um, uh, medical clothing. So you might need to shift your product mix still staying true to your purpose, but, but changing it. So those are things to think about. Uh, the demand forecast will be key to, to um, your process transformation. So understanding what consumer demand will look like, um, who will be buying, uh, how much will they be buying, what prices will they be paying, that demand forecast is key to your business operation, but it's also key to how you operate. So it may impact your supply chain. And it's important to, to think back and forth on how the demand forecast impacts your business flow. So we're encouraging you to think about these kinds of questions as you move forward. And at the end, you'll have a revised business plan and revised financials. And with a plan, you stand the best chances for a successful restart. So. I want to move on from here and I'm going to turn it over to Denise Fessler who's going to talk to you about the impact of regulations on your business planning. Denise, can you introduce yourself? Sure, hi. Um, I think the main thing with COVID and we talk about safety is um, really making sure that we know where to go for good information. There's so much information being uh, put out there. so. Um, what we're doing here is we're going to go through uh, some of the main areas you need to be looking at and focusing on to make sure you have the best information possible. COVID-19 is, a lot of the principles are very basic. We're dealing with the same classification of viruses that cause the common cold. So uh, we have to make sure that um, we're you know, washing our hands, basic things, staying away from people who are infected trying to make sure that we can make sure that we have a mask on if we're, we can't maintain distance. Those basic measures are very critical to making sure that you could prevent transmission of the disease. In the same way, it's very challenging. We still don't know um, how many people it takes to reignite uh, a real major problem within a community. So we're learning uh, every day about the virus, which makes it challenging for us uh, in our businesses as well. I recently attended a conference that I thought was really good. Um, the presenter, Dr. Hasseltine, uh, actually gave uh, an equation that I think really helps help me at least understand. It was the probability of transmission equals time divided by distance times the number of people that you have inside times the number of people without masks. So I think if you think about an equation like that, you can tell the kinds of things you're gonna to need to do in your business. The first area that you think about is safety measures to reopen and also to safely clean your business. And that's from the CDC and the Department of Health. All the um, places I'm citing for information are actually located in the page 22 of this presentation. So um, you'll have hot links to each of those. The CDC is critical. We know they just even updated their um, guidelines, they update frequently as we learn information, and it's very important to keep tabs on both that site and the Department of Health, which is also based on the CDC. There's also great information there, both in English and Spanish, 
uh, for you to use to be able to post in your businesses. Industry specific guidelines are also available. They change even more rapidly than the guidelines that I just cited because of the fact that they're very specific to your type of business. And if you're a business that kind of falls in between two types of businesses, it's good for you to kind of look at all the different types of things that people are doing in their industries. The site that um, I have uh, provided for you is from the American Industrial Hygiene Association. It's called Back to Work Safely. The other is um, industries, uh, associations have their own, like the Restaurant Association and others. You go to those sites. But I also encourage you to visit other states' sites. Um, some states are a little bit ahead of us, like uh, New Hampshire, for example, they're opening gyms. So you can get to see like an idea of what Pennsylvania's regulations will look like based on what other states are doing who've reopened um, businesses uh, ahead of us based on the fact that they are dealing with different types and levels of the virus. The process to reopen Pennsylvania, we know red, yellow, green phases. We'll be moving in about two weeks into the yellow phase in Lancaster County. Again, that site is important for us to keep um, on uh, the tabs as well because of the fact that the criteria is becoming more and more refined and you're going to find more and more regulations that relate specifically to your business type. Sources for PPE, hand sanitizers, thermometers can be sourced to the Pennsylvania Department of Community and Economic Development. They have a list of vendors that you can um, you know, basically shop around. It's at least 100 vendors. There are also some vendors locally, h, &H Group, I think this will, one of the um, distilleries here uh, actually provides hand sanitizer. There's, there's a lot of different sources for those, um, those pieces of equipment as well. Um, the, also the um, economic development company along with the chamber is working on making sure that they have sourcing for and support for small businesses to source PPE and other um, pieces of, of uh, thermometers and things of that nature. Sources of cleaning and disinfection and sanitizing agents, a little bit more um, challenging because it's not on the list, but we also have uh, three sources that uh, one of our members, Jim Brenner, actually helped to identify for um, you to support you and trying to find that information as well. Next slide, please. Okay, hey, yeah. <laughs> Some tips around um, what you should be focusing on as, as um, you're looking at your business. First and foremost, I said this before, is really making sure you're following closely those federal, state, and local guidelines, the county, um, city sites, um, also federally, the CDC, and also the Department of Health for up-to-date changes. And then linking to their social media accounts is really probably one of the best ways because those um, accounts actually get updated really quickly and get um, updates. You need to also think about developing a plan. Um, you may never have had a, 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 a safety plan before, so needing to have a, a COVID safety plan is, is really key and making sure that you're addressing all the different re requirements from a regulatory perspective in that plan and assigning somebody within your organization to be responsible to coordinate and monitor the plan. That's usually gonna be one of the owners, somebody who's operationally there and responsible. Bottom line, you have to demonstrate you can show that you can minimize the risk to both your employees and your customer base. Uh, OSHA, the CDC provide step-by-step -step guidelines for how you can put that safety plan together. Third is to educate. Uh, you need to educate your employees and your customers about COVID-19, how it's transmitted, how you can prevent it, how you can contain it, and how you're planning to contain it within um, your, um, your business. And Pennsylvania guidance for your workplace and control plan and measures, they've actually published pamphlets, other things that you can post in your, your place of business as well. And you want to make sure your customers understand what you're doing. It's important for them to understand uh, all the different measures and how they should act within your business. Creating a culture of caring is also very important. You want to make sure that your employees and your customers' health is really important to you and you convey that to them. And I think um, it, if you really focus on that and you have um, policies and procedures in place that actually focus on that, you're doing the right things naturally. 
So um, now's the time really for you to really communicate how much you care about your employees and your customer base. Um, and last but not least is you need to be really focused on and be prepared for an accordion-like process. You may need to open and close. Um, we saw this in France, for example, when they opened the schools and then they had a resurgence of the virus and they had to close the schools. We may be in the same situation where we start to reopen and, and close at different times during this, this pandemic. A lot will depend on, on uh, the public health, like I said, the, how the virus reacts within our community, economic conditions, businesses' ability to really demonstrate they can reduce risk, and availability of PPE as well as the local health system and their capabilities, which we are concerned about um, coming in the fall with what we're gonna have the flu on top of COVID. <laughs> so all these things factor into um, where we're gonna be probably headed from um, our phase of openness, so to speak. Our next speaker is Joanne Brayman. Thanks, Denise. Sure. It's, great, it's great to be with everyone. Some of you I know already, and uh, I am a SCORE mentor, and I tend to specialize in marketing. So I co-mentor with a number of you as a marketing co-mentor. Um, I tend to look at this situation from the outside in. In other words, I start by looking at it from a market and a customer standpoint, and then go to internal operations. And one of the things that Kathy already mentioned was market trends. And I know we have a tendency to look at the market trends today and, and think about them in a negative way, but everything that we're experiencing right now also creates new market opportunities. And I'll give you a real quick example. I have a daughter who's pregnant and instead of doing an in-person baby shower, I need to do a virtual shower for her. So in that space, as I started researching, I could really use the help of three different kinds of businesses. I need someone who can go around town and pick up gifts that can be then delivered to our house so that they can be open the day of the shower. I need someone to make food and deliver great little bagged themed lunches to all the local participants of this shower. And I'd love to have a technology platform person who can be there to support me just in case anything, you know, the, the train comes off the tracks. So here's the situation that on the surface, oh my gosh, we can't do an in-person baby shower, becomes a market opportunity for businesses who are thinking creatively about how they can expand their own offer. So let's talk about that a little bit further. Let's talk about customers and your value proposition. And by value proposition, I really mean your product and service offering. These two definitely go hand in hand. And the big question that you need to ask yourself is, do you need to change your product or service offer? And as a result, will your target market change, your target customers? If you had an older target audience, as an example, target market, and you have a physical location, you might find that your market's gonna be significantly reduced as a result of that. So you need to think about that now. Or the reverse might be true. How do you need to change your target market and if you change your target market, does your, does your product or service offering need to change? A couple of quick examples of this. Some of you have read about the Pennsylvania Renaissance Fair. Of course, they can't do what they always did, but they did look at the assets that they have, which is a giant parking lot as one of their assets. They're in the entertainment business, and they realized they might have an opportunity to become a drive-in movie theater instead. Well, their new target market as a drive-in movie theater is very different from their old one. They used to recruit customers from throughout Pennsylvania. Obviously, they're gonna be in the immediate area, probably a lot of families um, as a drive-in movie theater. So you've gotta think about, does my changed product and my customer um, definition match up and how did that change? 
And does it mean that you have to put together a new way or a new place to communicate with your target market? Another example, some of you may be familiar with the paint and sip locations. Again, people invite 25 of their friends, they paint a picture, they might um, sip some wine. Well, I know one owner of that type of business who has decided to put together art kits, individual kits, and she's selling them to nursing homes because the residents are um, forced to be locked in. So here's a very different both product and target customer. And she has to learn how to sell to that new target customer. But a brilliant idea. How about a team building event company? They did physical team building exercises with corporations. Well, now they have to offer virtual team building events. In fact, I'm aware of one company that's offering virtual team building campfires, complete with delivering s'mores and little packages to the participants in advance of that campfire. So again, you've got to twist and turn your product and service offer, and as a result of that, your customer may be changing as well. So the reality is nearly everyone is going to find that the size of their target customer market is going to be reduced. Almost all of you on the phone will find this, and that's either forced by regulation, maybe a little bit related to fear. In fact, the statistics today say that only about a third of people said they feel safe going into a big shopping environment. Um, so we know that, that at least temporarily, people will be fearful to come out. We also know that we're coming into a rough economic time. So a lot of your business segments could be reduced because people won't have the money in which to spend in the next couple of years. So all of that is going to force a reduction in your target customer group size. So you've got to figure out other ways to survive, other ways to make money. One approach might be to figure out if you can sell more to your existing customer group. Um, another example that I'm very familiar with, a small organic food store that I happen to go to has extend, extended their offering in a substantial way to include products that are actually non-organic, but also include um, staples that people need. And instead of having to go to a regular grocery store and their grocery store, they hope to be a one-stop shop. What that person is really trying to do is to move a customer from buying $30 each time or spending $30 to spending $50 instead. And that kind of improvement can definitely improve their bottom line. Next slide, please, Kathy. A couple of creative ways that people are using to reopen. A safe way of reopening um, if you're in the salon business, you can see on the left, they got creative. They're using a parking lot to um, open up tents and they're using that space to give haircuts because all the research says that exterior business is much safer than interior. And of course, the second slide is just a little bit of fun. They're um, passing out noodles in order for people to maintain their social distancing. One more slide, Kathy. So channel and sales. So we talked about rethinking who you're selling and what you're selling, but now let's talk about how you're selling. And I guess the easy answer is, if you aren't selling online, maybe you should start thinking about selling online, but this doesn't work for all of you. So think about lots of different options that you could get your product into the marketplace. Certainly, again, there's online buying, there's online ordering, there's pickup, there's delivery, but consider a couple of other things like appointment shopping. If you are um, a B2B customer and um, you want to set a, a set time to get together with them to work through your product offer, that's a more collaborative sale process and it can all be done virtually these days. 
can you set up a mobile version of your business, a la food trucks? Well, maybe it's not a food truck. They're big, they're expensive. Could you do something that's small and very portable that enables you to deliver your product or service? And this is definitely the time that you should be thinking about partnerships. Partnerships are critical. If there's one thing you walk away with from my presentation, think partners. I'm aware of an interior designer who reached out to a florist recently and had the florist deliver small bouquets to all of her clients. It was a thank you during this time when her business was down. The florist made some money, but also more importantly, expanded their customer list. I also know someone locally who approached a bakery who was a florist to start carrying mini bouquets. You know, think about it. You go in in the morning to the bakery and you pick up a Danish and daisies. And the best part is that after this is all over, that's a channel to market that's likely to continue. So could a food truck, instead of be, being owned by an individual, could it be owned by a consortium of food establishments? Again, partnerships. In that case, you would defray the costs and you would definitely create a more powerful offering to the consumer. So partnerships, partnerships. Next slide, please. Competition. So if you've changed your product, your target customers or your channel, in all likelihood, that means you have a new set of competitors moving forward. When each of you started your business, you probably did some competitive analysis. And I hate to ask you to do this, but you're going to have to go back to go again. You've got to do it again. You have to do your homework. Who are your new sets of competitors? What are their strengths, their weaknesses? And, and really importantly, what's their pricing? Because your costs are changing, right? They're all going up during this new normal. So how can you win against this new set of competitors that you have? Think about your points of difference. If um, no one else is offering a 90-day return policy, maybe you should start. If you're finding your competitors' attention to detail around cleanliness is a little lacking, maybe you beef up yours. So it is definitely about points of difference. We also know that down the road, there's going to be opportunities to partner with competitors, particularly with competitors who may decide to close their doors. So if you think about that, there's an opportunity to contact a competitor and say, um, would it be possible for me to buy your customer list? Would it be possible for you to write a communication to your customer endorsing me as a substitute for the product or service that they offered? And of course, operationally, you want to talk to them about any assets that they might have, equipment or employees that you might be able to pick up. Next slide, please. Branding and communication. So the starting point here is to ask yourself, does your company purpose, your brand promise, or your brand values need to change? If you were making socks before and now you're making masks, maybe indeed your brand promise needs to change. Your company purpose has changed. So you need to back up and rethink that once again. You want to think about whether this is a temporary move or a permanent move. You'll want to think about whether safety needs to be part of your brand values. And, you know, I'm not assuming that that's a given for everyone. If you're an ad agency, if you make videos in a small office, maybe safety is never going to be part of your brand promise. But you're, if you're in the retail business, if you run a restaurant, I believe it probably has to be part of your brand promise moving forward. Branding is also wrapped around your brand identity elements. Those are the tangible elements of your brand, what it looks like, what your logo is. Um, talk to Marla Bixler if you want to talk about brand identity elements. She rebranded this last year and has done an excellent job of that. And of course, many of you want employees to wear branded clothing. 
And what's the newest brand identity element for everyone to wear? Well, of course, it's, it's a mask. I was just at Thrasher's French Fries the other day, and employees there wear a mask in the brand color, and it's got the brand logo in the corner. It looks professional, it's consistent, it reinforces the brand. So think about the entire brand experience for your customers. From the beginning to end, every touch point that you have with your customers. Do they clearly know if you're open or not? First of all, do they understand how to transact with you? Are they supposed to call you? Um, are they supposed to go online to place an order with you? Do they do COD? Is it um, pay with a credit card in advance? So all of those different elements need to be thought through. If you're in the food business and people call you to place an order, will they get through to you in the first six rings? Will they be put on hold? If they're put on hold, is there a voicemail message that they're listening to while they're on hold? What should that message say about how you're doing business these days? Maybe your safety measures that you've incorporated. It's all part of the brand experience. And communication is absolutely crucial right now. I can't say it more simply. You must communicate clearly, consistently, and loudly with all of your potential customers. This is definitely not a time to be quiet. Even if you aren't open, you may think I'm closed, I don't need to be communicating. It is just the opposite. Someone asked me the other day, do they really need to update their website and also do social media? And of course my answer was absolutely yes. First of all, both of those are virtually free as, in, as is email marketing. So you wanna do those things. But if you have just a little bit of money, I'm also recommending, if possible, you spend a little money right now to continue to build and nurture your relationships with your customers. This would be the time to send out a postcard explaining what you're, um, how you're doing business these days, maybe making an offer that you're opening uh, June 5th and for the first two weeks, it's 10% off. I know a salon owner who sent out root color touch-up kits to all of her clients. Believe me, if I had been one of those clients, that person would have my business for life. So it's the time to spend a little bit of money to nurture those relationships. This is also the time to invest if you have a physical location in good signage. Denise mentioned making sure that you have those safety signs around. I encourage you to think carefully about doing those safety signs in a consistent manner to your branding. We've all seen the duct tape on the flooring to uh, encourage social distancing, but you have to, such an opportunity to enhance that brand experience. Blue duct tape on the floor is great, it's functional, but man, it doesn't do anything to sell you. So what instead if you ordered floor signage that said six feet away from the counter, almost there, six feet back from that, we can't wait to see what you've bought today, six feet back from that. If you order again in the next week, you'll get 10% off. Make the brand experience engaging, energizing, and consistent with your brand image. Everything from what they see at the door to the receipt that you print and send out at the end. Make sure that your brand promise, your brand positioning is on that receipt. Next slide and my last slide. Here are two examples of door signs from restaurants down in Rehoboth. On the right side, a big restaurant in town they chose to go into the website and print out the health department sign about whether I'm closed, I'm offering takeout, and it's a checkbox from the state of Delaware. On the left side, you see a message that someone chose to put up in the front of their location um, talking about hoping to see them soon. 
and will be open when it's safe to do it. So which location are you more um, excited about going to? Which one enhanced the brand better? So again, communication counts, do it very carefully. So that's the marketplace view. I'm gonna turn it back over to Kathy to talk about operations. Thanks, Joanne. So moving into operations, um, Denise gave you a, a lot of points to think about in terms of safety and efficacy and things you need to do for your employees, for the workplace and for your customers. Joanne gave you a number of insights on how to approach the marketplace differently and how to address your product mix if it needs to change and can, can leverage your skills and, and uh, company purpose in a new way or if it changes your number of customers, new customers or a change to your existing customers. So those are all things to think about and they all impact your workflow and uh, demand forecast. And so this is a perfect basis for interaction between your operations and your marketing because how that demand changes impacts how you do things. You also need to look at your operations and say, can I make things the same way I made them before? Can I make the things I need to make um, within the requirements? And so that may have a change on your capacity or on your cost or on you, how, how you lay out your restaurant or how you um, distribute your products so, or services. So it's important to understand that and to um, factor in those implications to your plan. Your inventory assessment will be really important. You, you probably had inventory on hand when, when the shutdown happened, assessing that inventory and, and how, how uh, it is. Can you continue to use it? Um, what do you need in terms of inventory to be able to operate in this new normal? And importantly around inventory is your supplier assessment. Uh, your supplier assessment is really key. Uh, some suppliers may be able to meet your, your demands, others may not. Uh, how you communicate with them will be really key to the quality of the relationship you have. So uh, you may have worked with the same suppliers for a long time. Some of them might be there, some of them might not. Some of them might have high demand and, and can't fulfill your requirements. So making sure you have alternate sources of supply is really important as you come out of this situation. Making sure you update your supply agre agreements, partner with your suppliers where you can so you become a, a, a preferential customer. Um, let them love you so that you get your materials as you need them. Um, update your supply, for, your supply agreements and continually reviewing that situation as you prepare to restart. Your supply requirements will be um, augmented based on your demand forecast and how you make your products. So the more you communicate with your suppliers on that, the more they'll love you in giving them advance notice of what you need when. Reviewing your lead times, are there things you can change there? Um, how is your capacity impacted? As you, as you make changes to your workflow, how you operate, there's, there's nothing more obvious than, than um, in restaurant seating and how you maintain social distancing and how many, how many tables you can have in the space and how you're going to um, uh, bring customers through that experience will change your forecast. But as you augment it with online and, and other and takeout, those things can all add up to a healthy demand, but it may be a different demand. So you need to think about how that impacts your workflow. Beauty salons need to think, think hard about how it impacts their workflow. Typically, they would um, process, start processing one client and cut someone's hair in between while they were processing. Well, you may or may not be able to do that. So think through that planning so that you get to an effective operational plan for when you restart. Make buy opportunities or things you can think about, maybe components that you made before you might choose to buy. And then, as Joanne mentioned earlier, when she emphasized partnering, maybe you can partner with other like businesses like you for group 
purchasing opportunities. And that can help you not only with availability, but also with pricing. So as you plan your operation, there are a number of key things to think about that can put you in the right stead as you go forward for the healthy business you want to continue to operate. Um, nothing more crucial than employee planning. And th the number one thing that, that we want to emphasize here is empathy. As you know, as you're planning to restart your business, um, how empathetic you are relative to your employees is really key. These are, these are challenging times for everyone, <coughs> so we need to be sensitive to that. So review your organization and how you, um, how you operated in terms of employee positions and where. Map out your restart scenario. And if you, we're not encouraging you necessarily to operate in the worst case, but plan in the worst case so you know where that will be and then you can build on top of it to get to the right um, a restart scenario for you. Um, making sure that you can afford the, the people in positions at the time you want to bring them back into your operation. There's a number of things to think about here, but planning is really key. Um, prioritizing people, getting the right people into the right positions is also an important factor to consider as you, as you lay out your operation and how you're going to use your staff to effectively serve clients and customers in that um, ideal experience for total customer satisfaction. So you need people with the right culture, pulling their weight, addressing uh, the performance you need to deliver. All of that will fulfill the brand promise that Joanne just talked about by walking the, walking the talk of how you want your brand and your business to operate. And finally, a point here that's really key is think about cross-training. It is, it is really critical now to make sure that you prepare to cover the workflow. So maybe you need people that can do a couple of different jobs in your operation so that you can have the flexibility to move people around to have the staff you need to operate your business. So cross-training is, is really critical to think about now. Many aspects of employee planning are, are key to your restart. Um, the next area that, that we wanted to touch on is back office planning. And um, I believe I mentioned up in the beginning how important cash is to your business, that cash is really king. And so thinking about your back office operations and what steps can you take differently than normal to help you um, manage in this situation. So look at your accounts payable, split them into categories that can be um, uh, prior, ways to prioritize where and how you, you pay um, these services. So look at those that are, are really critical to your business. Make sure that you're covering those so that you've, you've got those things covered. Um, negotiate terms where you can. You can do this with banks. You can do this with landlords. So don't, don't hesitate to ask and discuss it. It's not necessarily likely that they're going to suggest that to you but they're gonna to want to retain solid, loyal customers and they'll work with you. So don't hesitate to ask. So these are some things to think about. In terms of accounts receivable, you know, things are changing in this new normal in terms of um, where um, credit is extended, how cash and, and um, income is received for your business. So, um, minimize term credit, do everything on automatic transfer where you can to, to uh, minimize your cost. Those kinds of services are really key. Um, work where you can to minimize your credit service fees so that you can, can um, um, improve the value of your accounts receivable. Bookkeeping is, is critical. Um, many of you have received loans, um, PPP loans in particular, and EIDL loans, but for, PI, for PPP loans, it's gonna be really key that you can keep records of your business from when you um, signed to receive those loans until you pay them back. So, so for uh, loan, benefit, loan um, purposes in particular, bookkeeping is key. 
but also to keep track of your business operations so that you can really manage cash through this process. So how you maintain your books um, is really important. Uh, you may need to get a bookkeeper in these situations. Don't hesitate to think about that. Legal and insurance, review your liability protection and understand it. Make sure you know what insurance covers and for which losses. Um, your, your attorneys, your insurance agents, they will work with you through the situation, but you need to reach out and talk to them and understand um, what the terms of your liability protection are. Um, as I mentioned earlier, negotiate rent terms or lease terms. Everybody wants to stay in business and people will work with you. Do not hesitate to ask because the opportunity is there to negotiate the right terms for your business. Um, one other point on banking, if you, if you did get a PPP loan, you might want to consider creating a separate account for those funds. That will help you track them better for when you have to uh, demonstrate forgiveness and, and uh, respond uh, relative to the terms of your loan. And then taxes, work with your tax advisor to minimize tax liability. There are programs out there to help you and uh, you want to take advantage of those. So don't hesitate to work with your tax advisor to help you in those situations. So these are some of the, the mechanics of the business, but there's no time like now to think about how they can um, help you with your business. So now taking marketing, taking some of these thoughts and guidance on operations to help you plan to restart. I'm gonna turn it over to Rich, who's going to talk to you about financial planning to be able to quantify the implications of your restart plan. Rich? Thank you, Kathy. I'm Rich Bidgood uh, and I focus on the finance um, um, side of, of uh, mentoring and advising. And certainly during these times, I'm um, primarily focused on the finance side. But the financial plan is, is where we can make a model of, of your business and how it will work. And really everything I'm gonna talk about reflects many of the issues that, that Kathy and Denise and, and Joanne have already talked about, but this is where you can put it into a plan. And we're conceiving, at SCORE, we're conceiving the financial planning process as having three stages. Um, the first stage is this is the pre-COVID. Remember those days? The pre-COVID business model. Every one of, of our businesses had a financial plan going into the pandemic. Um, some of those plans were in the process of being revised. Some of those plans were pretty mature. Some of those plans were really just starting. Um, and, and as Kathy said, way back in the second slide, um, it represented the, the pre-COVID world. For the moment, wherever those plans uh, stood and whatever stage they stood, they've now been thrown overboard. And so the second stage of financial planning right now is to focus on the right now. And as Kathy said also earlier, that really means a focus on cash. Um, because that's, that's the most important thing at this very second. The cash pays the bills, cash <laughs> pays employees. If you have employees that are working right now, uh, pays the rent, pays utilities and so forth. So the second stage of financial planning right now is to do a financial health check, um, to ask critical questions. How much cash do I have? Right now, how much cash do I have? Perhaps in various bank accounts, perhaps uh, sitting around in various places, but accumulate it. How much cash do I have? How much cash will I have coming in over the next few weeks? If you're a business that has accounts receivable, how many of those receivables can you really count on coming in? Because some of your customers may be struggling with cash as well. Um, how much cash can you generate from ongoing sales? Some businesses are operating partially, and so they are generating sales. How much cash will you have? How can I get additional cash? Is there a way to get additional cash, either from other sources, such as, as friends or, or other owners, um, but also in, 
uh, with regard to loans, uh, especially the government loans like PPP and uh, EIDL. And as Kathy said, a critical part of the PPP, if we're talking about cash, for those of you who have it, uh, the PPP, is figuring out how to get it forgiven. That's the, that's the best source of cash. You don't have to pay it back. And then on the expense side, think about ways to save cash, uh, to reduce expenses. As Kathy said, landlords and banks uh, and others to whom you owe money um, are more open than ever to having the conversation about delaying or deferring or even forgiving some of those payments. Um, they're not eager to do it perhaps, but they have to, they have to make sure that you stay in business uh, and so they're willing to have that conversation. Some are more able, some are less able, but you have to ask. And, and don't, be, don't be nervous about asking and don't be afraid to ask. Um, everybody else is asking. So the question for this stage is really, how do I get through the next 30, 60, 90 days until we get to green? We're going to be moving to yellow soon but how do I, and that may allow some of you to start generating uh, more cash by opening businesses. Some of you can't, um, but really the question regardless is, how do I get through the next relatively, uh, we hope, short period of time? So the focus is on today's liquidity. The third stage uh, really begins to look forward beyond COVID and it requires a financial plan, uh, as, as Kathy and others have said, incorporating the things that we've been talking about that may be based on that financial plan you had going into the pandemic way back in stage one, but it's gonna look very different. Most of the assumptions in that plan will change. Uh, demand will certainly change either up or down, uh, probably multiple times. We always think about changing down as we think, for instance, restaurants uh, change down, but some, uh, businesses, believe it or not, are changing up. Uh, a man came to power wash our house the other day um, and, and he said he's now booked out uh, a number of weeks. He can't get to the business that's coming in. I think because everybody is in my situation where they're home all the time, they're looking at the back of their house and saying, my God, is this ugly. Um, and so they're calling him. Um, I spoke yesterday this is unfortunate, but with a psychologist who is now transitioning her business to online, and of course her demand is up. That's the unfortunate part, but her demand is up. The amount of time she has in a day has not increased. So uh, she struggles and, and the power washing guy struggles. How am I going to meet this demand? So the, the demand may go up, may go down. There is certainly near-term uncertainty, and I'm, I'm hesitant to call it the new normal because I don't think we've settled into a normal yet. It's the new abnormal, it's the new no normal, and, and that means we don't really have the ability to predict what the next few weeks will look like. Um, restaurants will certainly have to figure out how can they adapt to having fewer people in their restaurant. Now let's say 25% or 20%. Um, and if they're out in the parking lot, um, maybe that changes things. But it will change the cost of, of doing business. And that raises the question of, if the cost has changed, probably up, uh, am I able to change uh, my revenue coming in somehow, at least to keep the margins uh, uh, where they should be. And that's a different question depending on, on what kind of business you are. The, whatever you wind up, and however you wind up answering those questions, there are certainly new risk factors. And, and part of the risk is this accordion sort of situation that Denise talked about. We may open, we may go to yellow, we may go to green, and we may return to yellow. I hope we never return to red. But as we think about projecting what our business will look like, we have to ask, as demand changes, as my ability to service demand changes, and as it changes, and then changes again, and then perhaps changes again, um, 
how do I factor that in so that I can stay in business, do well, and, and survive and succeed? So we will, financial projections obviously will focus on cash flow projections. Um, and finally, it, they need to include flexibility. And I, I say financial plans in the plural because we'll have, you'll have to do a number of them to, to look at these various assumptions. Uh, next slide, please. And so just to, to put this into steps, what we recommend is, is this, perform a health check, perform that focus on where am I right now? What cash do I have? What availability do I have? And take the steps you need to maximize that short-term availability. Um, we talked about looking for more cash, figuring out where you can save money, looking at what government aid there is, and there will probably be more. Uh, the names of which I can't tell you right now. Um, create restart financial plans, again, in the plural, incorporating those assumptions, but then incorporating the uncertainties. What if they change? What if this happens? What if that happens? To plan now makes you better able to be prepared when those changes occur, and we don't know which ones they are. Um, of course, you don't need to do this alone. Use an advisor, a uh, SCORE mentor, for instance, uh, who, who can offer advice, but who can listen to you, who can question, who can ask friendly questions and say, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Can make some suggestions and can encourage you to keep thinking and keep moving forward. Uh, and then meet with that advisor frequently because whatever plans you make, will probably need to be revised as we go through this process uh, for the next X number of months. And I don't know what that X is, but probably for the rest of the year anyway. Um, and with that, uh, let me turn it over to Bob, who can wrap up. Thanks, Rich. As, uh, as you sit out there and listening to us, you're probably filled with uh, a few emotions. One of them might be anxiety, as, as you look to the future, but also I suspect confidence in, and pride, pride in what you've built, what's made you different and how you've attracted clients in the past. Um, but let me suggest to you, don't let that pride stand in the way of thinking through those differences. You've probably spent time creating an ambiance. If you have a retail store, uh, merchandising in a way to optimize sales per square foot, all that needs to be rethought to add an overlay of adjusting it for safety. Safety for you, your employees, and your, and your clients. Also, we talked about re-examining your business processes. How has your supply chain been impacted? How have lead times changed? How are you cultivating backup suppliers? But also, as you think toward hiring people, you probably had a set of behavior-based interview questions that you use. How do they stack up now that you need uh, for your business uh, in this post-COVID uh, relaunch? How will your onboarding and training change as well? We talked about um, having a financial plan and monitoring it frequently and adjusting it as necessary. Probably should emphasize adjust it as soon as it is necessary. The future may not be as forgiving as we've experienced in, in the past. Health and safety is paramount. And we talked about make it a conspicuous part of your brand. Take credit for it. Um, make it a part of your uh, customer experience and your employee value proposition. Uh, for example, if, if you have a restaurant, maybe you don't refer to when people arrive as, well, you're clearing the table. You're not clearing the table you're sanitizing it. And maybe you sanitize it twice. You, you sanitize it when people leave and you sanitize it when the new people arrive. Also, learn from your competition. Monitor them as well as other types of business. Don't be afraid to steal good ideas from anywhere. When it comes to managing demand and traffic, probably nobody is better than Disney. So watch what they're doing as they've opened up Disney Shanghai. And when it comes to cleaning and sanitizing, probably nobody is gonna do it better than McDonald's. 
if you're if you sell luxury products and you're looking for ideas maybe there's lessons from the switch watchmakers who are rethinking their bricks and mortar focus and moving away from just selling in high-end department stores and their own bricks and mortars be bold but not thoughtless react and change quickly to what you see happening in your business and what's going on around around us in the in your community and in the county and whereas in the past you probably engage your employees and encourage them to help you think of ways to do things better cheaper and faster now it's better cheaper faster and safer and also be true to your company purpose and values if you're not if you stray from them your employees will be the first to notice followed soon by your customers Next slide. <clears throat> I think most of you on this call are uh, do have a score mentor. If there are any who don't, uh, we'd be happy to talk to us. Uh, let's have, uh, have a conversation. You can contact us through the hot link that will be in the deck that you'll receive, as well as uh, that phone number listed on the screen. And a reminder, everything that we do is cost-free for you. Lastly, what we've included in this presentation are a summary of the links, many of which uh, Denise and others have spoken about. And these links, as, as we've said, you know, should be monitored frequently to make sure that you stay up on, on what changes. And in the last slide, do we have one more slide? Yeah. Here's a, here's a restart checklist. It goes over many of the things that we've talked about uh, in this presentation. And I think it'll be a handy, uh, handy document uh, to keep nearby. Now let me talk, turn it back to Kathy, who will open it up to Q's and A's. Thanks, Bob. And uh, thank you all for, for participating in our webinar this morning. I, we, we hope and sincerely believe that, that you can find a successful pathway through these unprecedented times. And we would like to be here to help you with that um, should, should you need it and, and should you desire to reach out. Our mentors are prepared uh, and ready to work with you. Let me start first with one question that came in on the chat. And Rich, this one really is directed at you. And then, um, please, I'm going to unmute everybody, and we can open it up to uh, general questions that you might have. So I've unmuted everyone, or I attempted to. <laughs> um, you did. So, so Rich, the question says: Many small businesses are open to taking, are are not open to taking on increased debt, and do not want to apply for loans. They are only open to the idea of grants and or forgiveness <clears throat> programs like the PPP, what do you suggest? Yeah. It's an excellent question. Um, and one of, the, one of the critical parts of the planning process is to think about how much debt a company has. Uh, and some businesses just aren't prepared to take on additional debt. Uh, there are, uh, you mentioned the PPP, and of course that has the forgiveness provision. Um, uh, and so that's a good source. Uh, there were a couple of other programs that had um, uh, <clears throat> forgiven debt or were grant focused uh, that were available that are no longer available, but there are still some that, that are. If you're downtown in Lancaster, uh, there are some grant programs for downtown businesses. Um, so there are a few floating around, so that's one possibility. There may be others coming down the pike from the government. Um, check back with your SCORE mentor, check back on the Lancaster Chamber website um, to see if, if anything new comes down. But really, as good as a grant is a deferral of rent or a deferral of a loan payment um, or a cost savings that you can find, um, that, that generates cash as much as a grant does. Um, and so, the suggestions for guidance would be look very closely at your operations and see where you can save some money. 
Thanks, Rich. Another question that's come in is any tips on rehiring as I have lost 50% of my team since they don't feel comfortable coming back to our storefront. I'll, I'll take a stab at it and then I'll open it up to any other mentors that want to comment on that one. Uh, one of the things that we talked about was developing a plan for how you're going to restart. You may be able to do some matching between the employees that you need to restart and how you can um, bring more of them on later uh, as your business grows and changes. So being cognizant of those employees and if you relish them as for the contributions they made, maybe you can, uh, can plan to bring them on in accordance with uh, their, their desires and your business needs. The other is um, we talked about reaching out within the community um, amongst your like type businesses. You may be able to find some other employees that way. And, and then beyond that, it, it really comes down to using some of the hiring resources that are available to help you get uh, new employees. But one of the pieces of advice that, that we've been encouraging people is when you rehire, rehire the people that can best fit into your business needs, making sure they have the right personality, culture, and skills you need to help you drive through this new normal. Those are some of the thoughts that, that I am sharing. If anyone else has some to share, please do. Kathy, let me just mention on the PPP forgiveness side for those who have um, PPP loans, there's a provision in the new guidance that came out on Friday for how to account for those employees that, that are unwilling to come back to your business. Um, and so that you don't get um, penalized for not bringing, bringing an employee back who does not want to come back. There's a, a documentation that you can fill out, recognizing it can also affect their unemployment compensation, but. Okay, thanks, Rich. Any other comments that people have on that comment? Let, let me just mention, because this question came up a couple of times, um, based on the email list we have, we'll be sharing the presentation and the checklist with you afterwards you'll find in that presentation, the hot links that we talked about and that are listed in the references will be live. Um, there's another question that came in. Do you know if Finata works, in, works for Lancaster for Hispanic and small businesses? And, nope. and I don't know, Rich, do you have any comment I, on that? I don't know. Uh, I'll, I can find out. That would be great. The mics are open. Um, it's been a lot of information we've shared with you and I'm, I'm sure you have thoughts um, swirling in your head. Please feel free to ask us questions live. Uh, we're here to help you. Kathy, um, for that follow-up question, what would be the best way to publish the answer for the Fanata question since I won't be able to find it in the next two seconds? <laughs> 22. We can add it to the um, information we send out. I've got their emails. Okay. okay, somebody's got background noise that they can. Um, uh, we have 22 pilots. <laughs> Better mute us all. Um, it doesn't matter to us. No. Okay. So if you have a question, please unmute to ask it. Are there other questions out there? Nothing? Now's the time. We're here for you. Nope. <laughs> I actually okay. have a, a comment as another answer to the uh, Jill asking about rehiring people. Uh -huh. um, so I'm in a situation and there are probably a few others that may be as well, where when the PPP money runs out, um, the organization I work for may lay me back off again. Mm -hmm. So I've, um, as many people are these days, have kept an eye open on job opportunities. The job market today is exponentially worse than it was during the last recession. Uh, when you apply for a job on Indeed, uh, in a couple of weeks they send you an update that shows you how many people have applied. 
So a couple jobs I applied for had two and 300 applicants. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is definitely a demand for uh, among potential employees for work. So I think in your case, if you had some employees who weren't comfortable coming back to your storefront, um, I think there's a tremendous pool of people who would be interested. And I think the key, whether it's bringing people back or bringing new people in is doing what you can to make them feel safe. But there are definitely lots of people out there looking for work. So you, if you ever needed to hire, now's the time. Interesting. Couple other questions that have come up. Uh, we're bringing our current team back with raises. Is this common? Any comments from the mentor pool that's here? Um, I have seen some PPP um, recipients bring people back uh, and in some cases provide raises um, either for demand reasons because they were um, uh, they really needed these people back or because uh, they had some extra PPP funding uh, that they couldn't spend on utilities and other things and raises slash bonuses um, qualify as PPP financing. And so in some cases they've, they've brought people back and used PPP funding for that, which as was just pointed out is only temporary. Okay, any other comments anyone has to share? We have another question. Um, do you think preparing for reopening and closing will impact sales business in the future? Would it make sense to stay virtual until green or does the opening and closing benefit the business? Kathy, I'll take a stab at that. Uh, Thanks, I friend. would want to recommend that you do open even with the prospect of having to go through this accordion process of closing. I think you want to show continued support for your customers in the community by opening. Now the caveat in that is if you're in a business that demands a, a real shift in inventory perhaps and to ramp up your inventory levels and then ramp them back down again could be very cost prohibitive for you. Um, that would make me rethink it perhaps, but otherwise I think being there, being available and having some visibility again is a good thing. Thanks, Joanne. Um, we got any other comments that anyone has on that question? Let me tackle another one. Um, do we know yet whether the payroll eligible for PPP forgiveness is payroll paid during the eight week PPP period or must the payroll also be earned during the eight week PPP timeframe? The guidance that came out on Friday says paid or incurred and it allows a little bit of flexibility for matching it up with your with your actual pay dates if you're a bi-weekly um, payer um, and so you cannot pay forward the next three months of pay if that's uh, uh, in order to use up your your PPP funding um, it, it does need to be matching up with what's been incurred um, but you don't actually have to cut the check. Um, but again, people are being a little creative and apparently it's permitted to uh, add some bonuses or, or raises or whatever, but it does need to be incurred or paid. Okay, thanks Rich. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the group? Please don't hesitate to ask. Kathy, in the slight lull, um, Fanata, does operate in Lancaster, but I don't know who the contact is. Uh, and so the best thing would be to contact Fanata. Fanata is a, a, a nonprofit um, small lender, um, but they do operate in Lancaster. They list Lancaster as one of their territories. Thanks for checking that, Rich. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, oh, we have another question. Um, so we have also moved some of our roles to permanently remote. 
this has opened up possibilities to rehire great team members who have moved out of state. And I will be working with my HR consultant to find out mm -hmm. how to hire a Florida resident as a PA employee. Any suggestions or comments? Rich on, on that one? Uh, I know I don't. Um, I think working with your HR consultant is a really yeah. good idea. And I do think you can do that in this new virtual way, but I think getting the right guidance both from an HR consultant and possibly um, uh, legally if you needed to would be helpful. Yeah, and I think for PPP purposes, if you have PPP, it doesn't, they only need to be in the US. So moving to Florida is fine if they move to um, Greece, for instance, um, you can't have them work virtually and have them be a resident of a non-US. She's rich, you have to stay here in the US. Apparently. <laughs> okay. All right, I think, I think that's about it for questions. Um, one of the things I would like to try to do, if you'll bear with me, is I have a very simple two question poll that I'd like to put up, if I, if I can do this correctly, and get some feedback from you as we carry this message forward. So let's see if it works. Did the poll come through, you guys? Mm -hmm. It's up. Okay. Two simple questions. That would be great. Oh, I can tell who's using an iPad because I suddenly see great big fingers moving toward the screen. <laughs> <laughs> Um, while they're doing that, Rich, we did get one more question. Mm -hmm. As for the PP loan, PPP loan, is it true that business owner payroll taxes are not covered by the PPP eligibility? There is a portion of the taxes that, that you do include, the employee portion you do not include, uh, and that is in a uh, guidance, and I can put that, I can send that quote to you, Kathy, um, and you can maybe include that in what goes out. I think Jennifer is wanting to make sure that you understand it's for forgiveness, which I think yeah, you no, understood. Right? Yeah, right. Okay. Okay. Great. All right. And in fact, that's in the, uh, if you go back to your lender or to the trout calculator that we have, uh, floating around, um, they will specify that which portion you can include, which portion you can't. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you all for your engagement and participation today. We really appreciated it. And uh, we wish you success as you plan to either um, continue and revive your business that you've been operating or to successfully restart it. So thank you. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you, all. everyone. Good luck. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, guys.